Uh, my name is Lucas. Um, today, it talks sort of generically titled Robot Manipulation with uh, Learned Representations. Um, so thanks for that introduction, Carl. I'll sort of redo a little bit of it. Um, so I'm a research scientist at the NVIDIA Seattle Robotics Lab. I got my PhD um, at MIT with, with Russ Cedric um, and working on uh, manipulation. So uh, doing tasks like you see here. Um, and as Carl mentioned, I previously worked on um, the DARP Robotics Challenge team before uh, starting uh, my PhD. Um, that was a great experience. I, I feel like I'm a classical roboticist at heart. Um, so I learned a lot from that experience and I encourage any of the students there, if you have a chance to be, to do one of these uh, DARPA challenge or other kind of challenge, I, I highly recommend it. You'll learn a lot. Okay, so um, sort of just an overview of the talk. I'm gonna talk about a few different projects today. Um, and I'm, hopefully there's gonna be a unifying theme that shows you how they all fit together. So I'll, I'll start with Densovic Nets and I'll go a little out of order in terms of like uh, intellectual ideas, but more like how the research was done. Um, I'll talk about KPAM very, just very briefly because it's, it's relevant. And I'll talk about these two papers. Um, and these are, these are all sort of connected. And then we'll sort of look at a different way of tackling some of the same problems in this, in this final work, clipboard. Okay, so just to set the stage, uh, so what do we mean by robot manipulation? So here's this video of like Boston Dynamics Spot um, doing some task in the kitchen. Uh, this is like one of my favorite ever videos, the PR1 teleop. It shows you just, you know, with teleop, you can do amazing things. Um, and then some examples of these more like open-ended uh, manipulation tasks at the bottom, like making sushi or cutting this avocado. And one sneaky thing is if you look carefully at this Boston Dynamics video, is actually an April tag uh, hidden right there. Okay, so uh, in robot manipulation, we want robots to be able to accomplish, you know, useful manipulation tasks sort of in the wild. So we might ask robots to do something, um, you know, with, with things that the robot hasn't necessarily seen before. And since I sort of am coming from a more classical robotics background originally, I like to try to reframe things in terms of sort of a standard sort of uh, optimal control or trajectory optimization problem. So our task is to, you know, find a policy pi that minimizes some costs, so maybe subject to some um, dynamic constraints. Um, and I think manipulation presents some fundamental differences and challenges from other areas of robotics. Um, and there's at least three. So first is what's the state space? Um, and the challenge here is actually thinking about the state of the world, not the state of the robot. So for the state of the robot, we can, you know, at least for a robot arm, it's pretty easy to read your encoders and see where your robot is. Um, the hard part is, you know, understanding what's the state of the world. So what's the state of this rope or this shoe? Second thing is it's not obvious uh, what the cost function is. So it's not necessarily just tracking a trajectory. Um, you might ask the robot to, you know, tie the shoelaces um, or do something with this rope. So how do you even tell the robot what you want it to do? Um, and lastly, you don't, you're not handed the dynamics uh, function. So again, this is the dynamics of the world, not the dynamics of the robot. So for the robot, we feel like it's pretty well captured by the manipulator equations, but you know, what happens if you interact with this uh, deformable object, that's pretty challenging. Um, and I will try to, so this naturally kind of leads to three research questions, which is, you know, what's an appropriate state space slash object representation for doing manipulation? Uh, secondly, how can we communicate task objectives to the robot, specifically in the case where the robot has to manipulate, you know, novel objects? And lastly, how can we enable robots to perform closed loop feedback control uh, for manipulation? And I'll, I'll come back to these two slides throughout the talk and kind of show you how each of the projects uh, fits in. So first, I want to talk about Densovic Nets, and I'm going to keep it uh, pretty brief and high level. I think, you know, this works a few years old at this point, um, but it is sort of the foundation for some of the other uh, papers. So I just want to set the stage. So it's really just tackling um, the first question. So thinking about what's the right uh, object representation. Um, so what is it? I'll try to have a slide like this for each, uh, each section, which kind of tells you, you know, what uh, this work is about and why. So this, it's a dense visual representation that's useful for manipulation tasks. It's not gonna rely on having 3D meshes or poses and it's gonna be self-supervised. Um, 
And why do we want this? Well, we want a rich uh, visual representation for doing manipulation beyond uh, pick and drop. And I'll explain uh, what I mean by that in a second. And then we wanted to get away from having sort of pre-coded uh, object templates. Um, so if we're gonna think about manipulation, I like to think about it in terms of tasks. And I think there's at least two axes that you can think about tasks. So one is sort of how general is the task and the other axis is how complicated is the task. So sort of at the top here, a very simple task that we ask our solution to be very general is the pick up anything task. So, you know, given a pile, just pick up an object out of it. Um, and so approaches like GPD or DexNet kind of fall in this category. And then you can kind of go down this list. And at the bottom is a really complex task, like cleaning up the kitchen, making a sandwich or doing the dishes. Right? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this picking up a specific object uh, task, because it's basically what was done in the Amazon Robotics Challenge, which was a good uh, sort of benchmark that happened a few years ago now. Um, so this is basically on the left is a video from XYZ. Um, on the right is a video from Team MIT Princeton. Like this is basically the Amazon Robotics Challenge. For those of you who don't know, you need to sort of pick items from a bin and put them um, either into another bin or into some storage solution. So how did teams do that? So most teams, I would say, by the you know, third round or third iteration of the challenge ended up at a solution that looked like the following. So they would basically have a grasp success model. So this model just says, you know, given an image or a point cloud, if I were to put my end effector at this position, would that be a good grasp? And if you need to pick up a specific object, you can combine that with something like an instant segmentation model. And there's been a lot of good work um, on both sides uh, of this problem. So if we think about you know, the mapping between, you know, problems in robotics and sort of perceptual representations in computer vision, I think we can learn something. So I think, you know, what we've seen over the last few years of computer vision is we sort of started with uh, models that were doing classification, then detection, then instant segmentation. So we're progressively getting sort of finer detail. Um, and that's basically the representation that was used uh, in the Amazon Robotics Challenge, basically segmentation. Um, so if you just want to do this pick and drop task, that's sufficient. Um, but if you want to do a task like this, so, you know, this will be an example from, from later in the talk, but if you want to do something like pick up this mug and then very precisely hang it on this rack by the handle, then just having a segmentation mask is not going to be uh, sufficient. Luckily, there's been other things happening in computer vision. So um, there's been uh, work on key point detection, which is actually how this uh, approach worked. But there's also been work on sort of dense representations, which is more analogous to um, dense descriptors. Okay, so dense object nets is going to go sort of one level down on this. So it's, it's just going to say, let's at least grab the object at a specific point. And that's sort of a, a toy task that we, that we made to sort of illust illustrate the approach. Um, and then the constraints we set for ourselves were that um, it should work for deformable objects, and it would be great uh, if it was self-supervised. Um, so just as an example, here's the kind of things you can do. So you can click on, on a uh, you know, point on the object and then go pick it up. And it was sort of the, the launching point for this was this great work from uh, Tanner Schmidt and Dieter Fox on these self-supervised uh, visual descriptors for this uh, sort of person re-identification um, tracking work. So I'll spend a little time on this slide just uh, to make it clear. Um, so what are dense descriptors? Basically, you take an input image, which is W by H by three, and you wanna map it to what we call a descriptor image, which is W by H by D. So D is just a choice on what your feature dimension is. And you want it to have a few properties. So you want it to have the property that these descriptors are invariant to things like uh, viewpoint and lighting and deformation. So you, know, you, should th you should think of them like a unique address for a point on the object. Um, so, you know, if I look at the descriptor for the tail and I rotate this caterpillar, that descriptor shouldn't change. Um, and if I think about uh, training descriptors with dimension three, you can actually visualize that as a color image. So you'll see this, this kind of picture um, a lot and all you're seeing is just the three dimensional vector visualized um, in RGB space. Okay, so how do we train this thing? I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. Um, basically, you need some way of, assume you have a pair of images for which you know correspondence. So we know that this pixel in the left image is, corresponds to the same physical point on the object as this pixel in the right image. 
Okay, then what we want, because we want our descriptors to be invariant, we want those descriptors uh, to be the same. So we're gonna have a, a loss that pushes them together in this uh, descriptor space. Um, that's only half the battle. We also need to make sure that, for example, the head of the caterpillar, we know that that's not the background. So those should be uh, pushed apart. Okay, and the total loss is just a combination of these two. And since then, uh, we've, we've you know, tried other uh, formulations of this. And I think the latest and greatest is using something more like an info NCE loss. Um, but the core idea is always the same. You need these pairs of images uh, for which you know correspondence. So how do you actually uh, get this kind of data? Um, so in our case, we basically use the fact that we have a wrist-mounted camera on our robot. So we can go ahead, take lots of images of a scene. This camera is calibrated, so we know exactly where it was, which means we can do a 3D reconstruction and then basically back project, choose a point on the object, back project it into two different pixels. So that's exactly what we're doing here. And that's how we get our correspondences. So it's all self-supervised in that sense. Um, so here's just like what that actually looks like on the robot. So, you know, you're going, taking a bunch of images um, and doing this procedure. And so this is uh, what you get out. So here's, you know, we're visualizing this three-dimensional uh, descriptor image. Um, and you can see Pete uh, moving this object around and you can see that the, you know, let's say that the ear uh, descriptor, it stays constant across these, you know, uh, viewpoint changes. Um, so this is, so what can you do with this? So for example, you can mouse over a point in the left image and then ask to find that corresponding point in the right image. And so here you can see that we're doing that um, in a dense way. So, you know, I said we would pick up object by a specific point. So you can do that by just clicking on, you know, the point of the object you want to pick up storing that descriptor and then at test time, the robot just goes, looks for that descriptor and picks it up. And here we're just using like a, a little grass planner that I, that I coded up, there's no magic there. Um, so it turns out that uh, even though there's no cross instance uh, training data, so there's no training data that connects these two different hats, it's sort of through the magic of deep learning just happens that they end up being consistent. So if you look at the descriptor space for these you know, different instances of the same category, um, they end up matching up. So that, so that allows you to do cool things like you can ask to pick up a shoe by the tongue. Um, and then you can ask, you can basically uh, get the robot to do that for lots of uh, different shoes. Okay, so just to wrap up that section, um, it's sort of setting the stage for the later talks. Um, so it works for any 3D reconstructable object. You don't need any prior knowledge. It's pretty sample efficient. And it's also interpretable, so and you'll see that later. So we can use it as an input to a variety of, of downstream algorithms. Okay, so uh, going a little out of order, but it's the order it was the work was done. Um, but hopefully it'll make sense at the end. I'm going to talk uh, just very briefly about KPAM. Okay, so coming back to this slide, um, it's really going to be tackling the first two questions. So not only how to represent objects, but also how to communicate. Uh, task objectives to the robot. Um, so what is it? It's a framework and algorithm for doing category level manipulation tasks. So uh, an example of a category level task is grab the mug and hang it on the rack, but do that for all mugs. Um, and it's this object representation that's gonna be able to handle this large interclass shape topology and uh, texture variation. And the reason we did this is we felt like existing representations couldn't quite capture uh, what you needed for doing these tasks. And although dense descriptors are great, they have um, some limitations, which I can't get into now, but um, we can talk about them at the end. So dense object nets in this sort of uh, matrix of tasks was living here. And KPAM is sort of going a little bit more uh, complex in the tasks. So you're asking uh, it to do a task like you know, put objects from a category into a specific uh, configuration. Um, so here's an example. So you need to grab this mug uh, and, and place it over here on the rack uh, by the handle. And you wanna be able to do this not just for that one mug, but actually for all these different mugs. And they might have different, you know, shape, texture, topology, et cetera. Um, so basically, the problem statement is you need to manipulate unknown rigid objects from a category into a desired target configuration. And we can sort of break this down into first grasping the object, which I think there are pretty good approaches for already. But the hard part is actually deciding uh, where you want to move the object. So that's the challenging part. Um, so 
I think pose is actually a really useful representation uh, for a lot of tasks, but not for these category level tasks. Um, and I think there's at least two challenges. Uh, the first is that it's not really well defined across different instances of a category. So for example, uh, that's an instance of the shoe category, but these are also instances of the shoe category. So what is the canonical pose? And also you have a choice when you do pose of where to put the frame. So it could be at the heel, could be at the sole, could be at the tongue or the toe. These are all valid for a single instance, but um, you know, they, it creates a lot of ambiguity. Um, so basically the, the solution that we pursued was to represent the object as um, semantic 3D key points. And just to preempt any questions, these are totally manually designed what the key points are. Um, and so that's sort of the role of the engineer, the modeler. And then you can represent the tasks um, by using costs and constraints on these key points. And this sort of um, was happening at the same time that key point detection was maturing um, in the computer vision field. So as an example, um, let's say you wanna put mugs up right on the table, you can represent the object uh, by these key points, let's say the top and bottom, and your action is just something that uh, moves the key points. So if you wanna specify the task of putting a mug up right on the table, you can write a constraint that let's say the bottom center key point um, is at the target location and the mug axis is uh, aligned with the vertical. And that allows you to put it into a pipeline where you can uh, you know, look at your scene, detect the object, do your key point detection, solve this optimization program to figure out what you want to do. And then you can actually use a grass planner, deep learning or not, um, to actually go ahead and execute that. And that can actually work uh, really well. So here's an example of doing uh, that mug on shelf task. Um, so we did a few other tasks. Um, and here you can see the key points that we used uh, for those different tasks. Um, and I'll just go uh, quickly, but you, know, you can do this uh, shoe on shelf task and you can do it for lots of different shoes. So here's all the different shoes that we use, including some like little baby shoes um, that our uh, engineer Steve brought in. And you can do it for um, you know, all these different uh, shoes. So one nice thing is that if you, you know, the performance of these deep learning sort of supervised learning methods is that their uh, performance is really only limited by the data. So during the MIT visit days, um, we were running this demo live and Danielle Roos actually came and, and put her shoe on the table and it was sort of like a high heel licking black shoe, which we, we didn't have in our training set, so it failed. So we just went out on Amazon, bought a few uh, high heels, annotated them, and then you know the next day uh, it was working uh, well again. So that's the nice thing about um, you know being in the data-driven uh, supervised learning world. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, it's a novel formulation of the category level pick and place problem that uses semantic 3D key points as the object representation. And then you can think about specifying the task using costs and constraints on these key points. And then it's a factorized pipeline for actually um, doing that. Okay, so uh, the next uh, project I wanna talk about is um, this project, which has this acronym SSCVPL. So it's called Self-Supervised Correspondence in Visual Motor Policy Learning. In hindsight, it was a, a bad title. <laughs> um, but uh, that's why we make up this acronym. But um, uh, this project and Key Points into the Future, they're really building uh, directly off uh, dense object nets. And it's two different ways of using that object representation um, that we developed uh, in the beginning. So this uh, approach is going to use it in an imitation learning setting, and this will use it in a model based uh, RL uh, setting. Okay, so in terms of uh, the research questions, um, this paper is actually gonna be tackling all three. It's one way of tackling all three. The next uh, approach will show a different way of tackling all three. Okay, so what is it? Uh, it's a factorization of vision motor policies um, using dense object nets as the uh, core representation. It's going to use this factorization to perform uh, efficient uh, imitation learning. And the reason we did this is we wanted to get to closed loop feedback control policies for manipulation. So everything you've seen so far is still in the realm of, you know, the robot looks at the scene, uh, takes a picture, figures out what to do, and then closes its eyes and executes at open loop. And we, we really wanted to get to closed loop um, feedback control. Um, so just a little preview of the results. So here, um, 
are like four different tasks that we trained in the world. So hanging a hat on a rack, um, picking up this plate, and this sort of uh, planar pushing task. So let's say you want to do this uh, hanging a hat on a rack task, right? Um, so this is actually the view from our externally mounted camera. Um, so how might we architect this policy? So I think a pretty standard uh, approach uh, to vision motor um, control would be you would have some uh, large vision model like a ResNet that takes your full image and compresses it down to some low dimensional latent state. You combine that with uh, your robot state, like you know the pose of the gripper, um, your joint angles, et cetera. And you put that through a uh, you know relatively small policy network, typically just a few layers of MLP, and then you get your action, which is let's say end vector velocity. Um, and so what people have used uh, in the past, there's many different ways of training this um, vision model, um, but a, a common choice is to use something like uh, an autoencoder. And then this Z would just be the latent um, from that autoencoder. Um, and there's been a lot of good work uh, doing that. So what we did is we decided, hey, actually tracking this object and knowing where it is, that seems like pretty relevant information um, for doing this imitation learning uh, task. So let's actually use uh, key points on the object. So let's you know, select a bunch of key points on this object. Let's track them with our uh, dense descriptor representation um, that we built at the beginning. And let's, let's use that as the input um, to our Visio motor policy. Um, so this is a slightly different setting to, to when, we, when we saw training on like the caterpillar and the shoes, because this is a dynamic scene. Um, so the way that we get the correspondences is we have multiple time synchronized cameras um, and we can uh, get correspondences that way. So let's say we know that this point over here corresponds to that point over there. Um, so here's just an example of uh, tracking, let's say the uh, a point on the bill of the hat like through time. So here you can see tracking just that one key point um, through demonstrations. Um, and actually, when we actually run, uh, we're going to train this policy, we need, we need more than just one key point. So we're actually going to track um, you know, multiple key points. So here you can see the reference key points, and here you can see them uh, tracked uh, through time, and here you can see the, uh, the heat maps um, of those tracks. Um, so in terms of actually training the policy, it's a pretty standard uh, behavior cloning approach. Uh, there's no magic there. I mean, there's many important details. Um, but no fundamental magic. So how do we get the demonstrations? Um, well, it turns out uh, both Pete and I are pretty skilled uh, teleoperators and we have this uh, mouse keyboard uh, interface. Um, so in this task, uh, the goal is to push this, um, you know, sugar box uh, to the red line. And this is all uh, trained with just like 50 demonstrations. So here you can see this is actually the policy running in closed loop, and it's doing feedback off this uh, camera here. And this is just a close up showing you that you can actually get really high performing policies out of this that are quite smooth and, and reactive and precise. Um, so here it is, you know, working on this uh, hanging the hat um, on the rack task, uh, which is like a slightly deformable object. And you'll see in the next uh, example, I think that, um, you know, we're gonna like perturb the hat halfway through and, and it will still work. Okay, so uh, if you remember, uh, we showed that the dense descriptors have some ability to generalize across a category. So here's uh, correspondences on the same uh, shoe, but if we change the target shoe over here, um, this model actually uh, still works. Okay, so this allows us to basically uh, do demonstrations on a bunch of uh, different shoes um, and then actually deploy on uh, lots of different shoes. So this is all the trained agent um, uh, deploying this policy. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, it's an, it shows how to use uh, dense descriptors in the context of an imitation learning task. Um, and you can demonstrate really sample efficient um, imitation learning using this. Okay, so this approach was basically using um, uh, dense descriptors to do imitation learning. And now we're gonna show another quite different way of uh, using um, dense descriptors uh, in a model-based uh, RL setting. So in terms of coming back to these sort of uh, core research questions, again, this approach is gonna be tackling all three, but in a different way uh, than the previous approach. Um, 
So, you know, what is it? It's uh, using dense descriptors as the visual input to a uh, dynamics learning model. And then we're gonna use that learned dynamics model to do closed loop feedback control uh, via MPC. So the reason that we wanted to do this is we still want to get closed loop feedback control policies for manipulation, okay? But we don't want to rely um, on imitation learning and I'll get into to why. And one of the reasons why is that having a model um, allows you to achieve uh, diverse goals at test time uh, via planning. So here's uh, an example of that. So here's it, here it is, you know, doing one, tracking one trajectory or task. Um, and then you can use actually the same approach to, to do this other, you know, spinning around 180 and then um, doing this pushing. And this is all a closed loop visual feedback off uh, this camera right here. Okay. And just to convince you that you really do need uh, closed loop feedback, here's a closed loop policy on the left and open loop policy on the right, um, starting from as close um, as I could to the uh, original initial condition. And you see that um, it just uh, completely fails. All right, so let me uh, come back to my uh, tried and tested sort of optimal control slide and kind of show you how the different pieces you've seen so far um, fit together. Um, so KPAM, right? We said we're gonna, X is gonna be these uh, semantic 3D key points on the object. Um, the cost function is gonna be this optimization program, um, you know, let's say costs and constraints on the key points. What is the dynamics function here? Well, we cheated a little bit. Um, we basically said that once we rigidly grasp the object, um, or once we grasp the object, it's rigidly attached to the end effector, it doesn't, it just moves uh, with our end effector. And then the way we got the policy was by you know, basically solving a trajectory optimization problem. Um, so the, the self-supervised uh, correspondence in visuomotor policy learning paper uh, took quite a different approach. So it's not gonna think about a cost function explicitly. It's not gonna think about a dynamics function. It's basically directly gonna go uh, for a policy um, that it got uh, via behavior cloning. Again, X here was um, the key points that are now tracked with uh, dense descriptors rather than uh, supervised learning um, like in KPAM. Um, and so the motivation for this work is that, you know, the imitation learning work, it's great, but it has some drawbacks. So it can really only achieve a single goal. Um, and I'll hopefully the last uh, part of the talk will, will show an alternative to this. Um, it requires expert demonstrations. It can't learn from off policy data. And also your performance is limited um, by the demonstrations themselves. Okay, so how does key points into the future uh, fit in here? So um, we're gonna learn a dynamics model. Uh, X here is again gonna be uh, key points on the object that are tracked uh, with dense descriptors. Um, we're gonna have a uh, cost function, which is like a trajectory tracking cost. And then we're gonna find the policy by actually solving an MPC problem um, online. And that's how we're gonna get uh, our feedback uh, controller. So how are we gonna learn a dynamics model? Um, so this is a typical form of a dynamics model. Xt plus one is f of xt ut. Um, but the problem is you don't actually have access to, to x, which is the state, right? You only have access to observations, which are basically these images plus any appropriate subject information um, from the robot. Um, so how should we represent the object state? Um, so there's different uh, approaches out there. You could do pose, full image, some low dimensional latent state from an autoencoder. Um, but as you can guess, we're gonna use uh, key points and we're gonna track them uh, using the dense correspondence model um, from the first part of the talk. Um, and then what we wanna learn is a model that says, if I were to you know, apply uh, certain control inputs, in this case, end effector velocities, where would these key points go? Um, so how do we learn this dynamics model? So you first collect a bunch of uh, interaction data and this doesn't have to be you know, on policy, it's just arbitrary interactions with the object. Um, and then you train a uh, dynamics model to do uh, a one-step prediction. And actually you can run this recursively to do like an H-step prediction. And then you can have a dynamics learning loss that you try to match uh, your predicted uh, state, H steps in the future with the ground truth state. Um, so comparing sort of the training data requirements from this versus the imitation learning. So this is just 10 minutes of interaction data that we use to learn the dynamics model. It's, it doesn't require expert demonstrations. 
It, you can use all the data, not just on policy data. Um, and it's a global dynamics model. And if you compare that to the previous approach, we used uh, 50 demonstrations just to learn uh, one task. And it required sort of on policy data. So just to show you that uh, the dynamics model we learned is pretty performant. So in green, you're seeing the ground truth tracks um, of those key points. And in blue, you're seeing the predicted tracks. So um, it's, it's uh, fairly accurate or accurate enough to do uh, feedback control. So let's say um, you know, we want to solve the task of pushing this box from uh, this start state to this goal state. How are we going to do that? So we're going to set up a uh, model predictive control problem. Um, so the initial state is shown there in blue. The goal state is shown there um, in, as the green key points. Um, but it's actually not easy to solve this uh, planning problem, even if I gave you a known dynamics model. And that's because uh, this is a, the dynamics here are hybrid, they're nonlinear, and so this becomes a non-convex optimization. Um, and so currently, because F is a neural network model, or uh, we use a gradient-free optimizer, um, MPPI, um, and the way that we're going to solve this problem is we're going to give a, a single demonstration. Okay, so the demonstration, the human did this uh, task, we get to record um, the trajectory of those uh, key points. And we can use that in a trajectory tracking cost. So instead of just having the, fun, the terminal cost here, we can have a running cost. So uh, to show you what this uh, trajectory looks like in 3D, um, here is a, a 3D visualization of those key point tracks. So um, just to show you uh, the MPC in action. So the current state again is in blue, the goal state's in green, that's the demonstration trajectory. And these uh, sort of magenta key points are the uh, predictions of the MPC algorithm, you know, at the, you know, at the best uh, controls that it found. Um, so here it is, uh, hopefully if it plays. So here it is uh, running in, in closed loop um, and executing this trajectory. And you can see, you can actually uh, track it uh, quite well and, and get pretty accurate performance. So the nice thing um, is that you can actually use this one model uh, to track lots of different trajectories. So here are four uh, different trajectories. Again, there's just one human demonstration uh, per trajectory and you can use the same uh, dynamics model and same algorithm um, to do all of these. Um, so here you can see it uh, again, just running in closed loop and you can kind of do these like, you know, spin 180 uh, and then push type things. Um, let me just skip through this. Um, you can, you know, you can also be robust to uh, external disturbances. So just like we did in the imitation learning, uh, it's a little harder here because this agent uh, moves uh, faster. So you actually have to be pretty quick with this pusher stick to actually disturb it. Um, and just to show you uh, that it works. So here's it doing it, uh, doing this pushing task, you know, 10 times in a row, um, you know, uncut. And you can see that it's uh, you know, very actively uh, doing feedback. Okay, so just to wrap up um, this section, it's a novel uh, formulation of uh, sort of predictive model learning that uses dense descriptors as the object representation. Um, and then we showed uh, lots of real world experiments. If you're interested in the simulation experiments, uh, I encourage you to go uh, look at the paper. Okay, so I think I have about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, so I, I want to switch gears and sort of uh, turn the talk on its head and, and show a very different way of thinking about um, some of the same problems. Okay, so in this section, I'm going to talk about uh, Clipboard. Um, so in terms of the research questions, uh, we're taking a little bit of a step back here. So we are going to think about sort of the state space representation or the state representation. We're going to think about how to get the robot to do what we want, but we're not gonna be doing real-time feedback. We'll leave that for, for another time. And the key part is that we're kind of not uh, gonna think about this X world so explicitly. Um, so uh, what is Clipport? It's a language conditioned uh, imitation learning agent uh, and it's an action centric approach. So we're gonna directly think about predicting action affordances um, and we're not gonna think about objects uh, at all in any explicit way. 
And the reason is that we want uh, agents to be able to achieve diverse goals through language conditioning. And we want to take advantage of uh, spatial equivariances for efficient learning. And this is uh, sort of heavily based off uh, the Transport Networks paper. Um, and also, you're going to see some benefits of relaxing the object-centric assumptions of some of the previous approaches. Um, so coming back to this trusty slide, we're not going to have a cost function explicitly. We're not going to have a dynamics model or really a policy that operates off uh, state in the sense of you know, key points on an object. Instead, we're actually just going to learn a policy that directly, oh, this should have been a pie here, but that directly um, operates off uh, the observation, which is going to be an RGBD image and also a uh, language instruction. OK, so uh, the key thing about Clipboard is that the agent directly tries to predict what it should do. So here, um, if you say put the red blocks in the green bowl, um, the agent is actually, or sweeping these beans into this blue zone, the agent is directly just going to think about like where should I pick and where should I place? It's not going to think about pose, segmentation, category, or anything like that. And the nice thing is that uh, one of the drawbacks of our, our previous approach and also transport networks is that, you know, you train an imitation learning agent, you can only do one thing. Um, so here we use language as a conditioning mechanism to allow uh, this imitation learning agent to achieve uh, multiple goals. So I want to uh, take a few minutes here to talk about object-centric versus action-centric approaches, because you'll, you'll have seen both in this talk, and I think the distinction is, is fundamental and important. Um, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. They each have their place, but it's interesting to, to think about the different options that are out there. So dense object nets, uh, you know, it's this very object-centric representation where we're learning these descriptors that have some invariances. And then we showed how to use that uh, to do, uh, to extract some sparse set of key points and then do imitation learning with it. We also showed how to use that uh, and learn a dynamics model on those key points. And then sort of related, but slightly different, we showed that if you do supervised learning for these semantic key points, you can use that to do uh, category level talk, tasks. So that was all in the first, um, you know, the first section of the talk, right? And these are all firmly in the object-centric uh, world. So all the representation is focused on an object and it tries to track it uh, typically through space. Um, so Clipboard is sort of a very different way of, of thinking um, and sort of inspired by transport networks. And so Clipboard is directly uh, detecting actions, uh, not objects. And I'll explain what that means in a second. So um, I think uh, my co-author Pete originally coined the object-centric versus action-centric um, thing, or at least that's where I heard it from. Um, but I'm going to copy it. I think it's a really nice uh, way of thinking about it. So this, this approach is very much going to be in the action-centric uh, world. OK, so uh, Clipport is heavily building on transporter networks. Um, so I don't know if everyone has seen this paper or not, um, but I'll just kind of give a very uh, brief overview. Um, the key points about it are that it exploits uh, equivariances in spatial structure. It's sort of doing this exhaustive search of replacements, which gives it um, nice, some nice properties. And also, it can learn efficiently from a few demonstrations. So just as an example, suppose you're trying to do this uh, pick block and place and fixture task. Um, so what you do is you get your image, you convert it to a top-down height map. So here, this is what the robot is seeing. And then there's sort of two parts to this approach. So first you're gonna decide where to pick. And that's, uh, let's say you're gonna pick right here at this corner. And then once you've decided where to pick, you need to decide uh, where to place. And they have this very uh, clever um, approach where you basically take a crop around the pick region. Um, and then you're gonna take, think of it as a query and key. You're gonna slide <laughs> that over the image. And then, um, you want that to activate um, at the place location. Okay, so I can't do it justice uh, in, in just these few minutes, um, but hopefully that gives you the, the high level idea if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, and each of these um, is a network. So these, these Greek letters like phi and psi, and they call them like query and key networks. So what is uh, Clipboard and how does it compare to transporter networks? So. Um, the difference is in, in the core network architecture and the fact that we use uh, language instructions. Um, so 
when I say network architecture, this network architecture is actually just one of these. And there's actually three of these in the, in the uh, ultimate um, you know, agent or learning algorithm. So let's say uh, this is the, the task. So I'm looking at this top-down view of this task, which is to pack all the blue and yellow boxes uh, into the brown box. And I want the agent to do that, right? So the, the top part of our network, which we call the semantic stream, um, it consists of a frozen clip ResNet 50 and also um, a clip uh, sentence encoder that's also frozen, okay? And this is uh, using contrastive pre-training. So just the way uh, these are like the pre-trained weights from clip, um, which are trained to do this um, sort of cap image caption um, image matching task. Um, so clip just ends at these low dimensional embeddings, but to do these, uh, to think of it as in this action centric way, we need to bring this back um, up to full resolution. So the way we do that um, is we have uh, some decomp layers and skip connections um, that bring this uh, back up to full resolution. Um, the bottom stream is basically the same as transporter networks um, where you take in your RGBD image, you have a uh, fully convolutional network that also ends up in a full resolution image. And then we have some, uh, you know, some cross connections here. So this is the core network architecture. So basically it takes as input a, uh, an RGBD image and a language instruction, and it outputs a, a full resolution uh, image um, of deep features. And then, you know, each of that actually gets repeated three times in the agent. Um, and we use that in the transport networks uh, architecture. So uh, here's that uh, same task, uh, sort of from a different view. So suppose um, you want to do this. The approach we're going to use is a uh, few shot imitation learning. So there's going to be an expert. It's going to give us some certain number of demonstrations, and then we should be able to, uh, to execute the task. So in this case, it's you know, packing all the yellow and blue blocks into the brown box. Um, so the input is the RGBD image. So it's a top-down height map, um, the language goal. And then the output is where to pick and where to place. Okay, so there's no explicit notion of objectness. Um, so we're really detecting actions, uh, not objects. Um, so here it is uh, doing the task. So it's um, gonna end up grabbing all these objects and uh, putting them in the, in the box. Okay, so you can do this um, you know, for other uh, color combinations, let's say. Um, but you can also, because you're not relying on uh, poses, you can, you know, do things like uh, dealing with, you know, moderately deformable objects. Um, if you're just trying to push piles, you don't need to have segmentations or anything. Um, and also you don't need, you know, there's no categories or like language parsers. So you can, you know, given a language instruction, uh, figure out what to do. Um, so um, I'm, I'm getting to the end here. Um, so I encourage you to look at the, the paper for, for more details. There's lots of uh, different tasks in there, but I'll sort of try to just give you a highlight of the results. Um, so how do we actually collect uh, expert demonstrations? Uh, so in the real world, we have, you know, like a, a point and click interface where you say where to pick and where to place. And so this is the demonstration of, you know, folding this towel. Um, and so here's the data set um, that Mohit collected um, for this uh, folding task. Um, so you can see it's like very small, just like nine examples. And uh, this is the data set that was used for all the, the real world um, tasks. So you can see it's really small. There's just 180 um, like transitions total. Um, so you can do lots of uh, different tasks. So you can you know, fold the cloth, move chess pieces. You can you know, put blocks into the correct colored bowls following, following the language instruction. Um, and so it's actually quite performant um, from a small amount of uh, data. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend any time on this. Um, this is mostly just to show you that there's lots of analysis in the paper and I encourage you to go uh, take a look if you're interested. In. But I'll sort of try to highlight um, one uh, interesting result. Um, so of course it outperforms some baselines. Uh, it's very data efficient, which was what allowed us to do all those different tasks uh, in the real world. And then the interesting thing, um, which is this uh, sort of teal line here, um, is that training a single uh, model to do all these tasks can actually improve performance. 
Um, and our hypothesis is that, you know, this is because language is compositional. So, you know, if you get an instruction like, you know, bottle in one task, um, that actually can transfer over to another task. And I think that's a unique feature uh, of language that we're really excited about as compared to doing something like a one hot encoding for each task. And sort of in that thread, um, you know, Clip is amazing at doing zero shot transfer and Clipport does not have that feature uh, currently. But what it does have is that if you see, um, you know, an attribute, for example, a color in the context of one task, like let's say you see pink in one task, but not another task in the expert demonstrations. If you actually train a single model um, to do all the tasks, you can actually transfer that knowledge across tasks. So it's a little bit subtle to explain, um, but ultimately uh, these, it's this uh, magenta clipboard multi-attribute model. There is some ability to, to transfer um, attributes across tasks that I actually think is, is quite interesting as well. Um, okay, so uh, just to wrap up, Clipboard, it's a two-stream architecture for doing, for using these internet uh, scale pre-trained vision language models um, for conditioning precise manipulation, um, and then uh, lots of empirical results along with an extended um, benchmark of language conditioned uh, manipulation tasks uh, in the Ravens framework. Okay, so with that, um, I just want to wrap up. So. Uh, we showed dense object nets, which is this dense pixel wise um, representation, showed it how to use it in an imitation learning context and also uh, a model-based RL setting. Um, KPAM was a, a different way uh, to using supervised learning to represent categories of objects. And then those were all firmly in the uh, object centric world. And then finally we showed Clipport, which is this uh, action centric approach, approach for doing um, language conditioned uh, imitation learning. Um, and with that, I wanna thank my, my collaborators, um, especially uh, Pete, who I worked with on a lot of these papers and uh, Mohit, who is the lead author on um, Clipboard along with Dieter. Um, and with that, I am happy to uh, take questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, now, People in Zoom, uh, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions you may have. Um, and same goes for people in the room. Or, yeah, um, so I guess you can start. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your question, lectures. Uh, so I have a question. So I, I believe it's in uh, slide 98. So it's, it's got something about the dynamic model uh, can uh, accompany. Can you get like closer to the mic or something? It's very hard to um, to, to hear. Could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, the microphone is oh, 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 okay. So uh, in slide 98, so you you have shown that you can accompany a test of, uh, based on fitting demonstration. So I wonder that, uh, so, have you tried using some techniques such as machine learning? So you know machine learning is a state-of-the-art technique for real life or something like zero short learning or few short learning. And so since that, according to the paper that I please uh, report by Stanford, it, it can only uh, require 10 to 20 a demonstration to learn a new tech. So I wonder if you have tried that tech. So we uh, accomplish your test uh, or, or such. So, yeah, so we didn't do, um, we didn't do any, any meta learning, if, if that's your question. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, so are you talking about this, uh, this approach here? Um, so yeah, we didn't do it, any meta learning. Um, I think meta learning is definitely uh, an, an interesting approach, but I haven't, uh, we, we didn't do any. Um, I don't know if I, I I don't know if I got your whole question there, um, but maybe you can send me an email and I can respond to you. It's quite hard to hear. Uh, I wonder uh, what is why why don't you choose maternal name? Is is that I think that maternal name uh, has some problems such as it's not stable enough or or how you compare your method with? We didn't do any meta learning. Uh, um, I think. 
that's the that's the short answer. Um, I have other reasons why I don't want to. I mean, you have to design the whole task schedule for meta learning, right? Like you have to have your whole family of tasks, and, and they, yeah. you know, that that actually task structure tends to be pretty important, right? Okay, and for the last pro last project, and uh, you you use some something like language to uh, to combine with your model, and I wonder uh, how you can. How or what is the look, what are the role that this language uh, play, plays uh, in your model? What what is what? What is the role uh, that the language plays in your model? Since what I, is the role that it plays? Yes. Uh, what I mean is that why do you use the language in your So system? why do we use the language? So the reason is you want to be able to achieve like different goals, right? So um let me get to the right slide. So, you know, here, the language is basically a conditioning mechanism to tell the robot what you want it to do, right? So you're saying, in this case, you're saying pack the yellow and blue box into the, into the box, whereas like you might have a different setting um, where you say, uh, it's maybe the next slide, where you give a different language instruction, right? Um, and we've got lots of examples like that um, in the paper. So um, you might say, you know, here you're asking it to pick up a specific object and put it in the box. So the language is just a conditioning mechanism, right? Oh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, um, great talk, Lucas. I really liked it. Um, so the objects in the files, um, I was really you know, impressed with all the videos of recovering from like physical disturbances. And I was wondering like if you tested anything with having them recover from like visual disturbances or like um like obstructing kind of the view in the pipeline, like closed the pipelines. Yeah, we did. Um so oh maybe I just like, that. <laughs> I just skipped <laughs> over these slides. So Here's one with some amount of um, distractors um, mm -hmm. and it still works. I would say it's it's harder to get the robustness if you're doing the like model-based control versus imitation learning. Um, mm -hmm. For the imitation learning, let me pull up, you know, my favorite uh, example here. Um, Oh man, I don't think I have it in the main talk, but. Um... Yeah, I was just wondering because like, I know that a lot of, a lot of people- Here's an of... example. Oh, okay. But um, I mean, basically as, lo as long as you have uh, some distractors in your training, you know, if you're doing imitation learning, it can actually adapt to that uh, pretty well. Um, because sort of if the, if the key point tracks that you're following are a little bit noisy, um, because you're doing imitation learning, it can learn to deal with that noise as long as it, as it was in the training um, data as well. But I will say, you know, full occlusions and occlusions in general, I would say, are one of the major challenges here. Um, and, you know, I think this works as a step in that direction, but it doesn't solve it. Yeah. Yeah, because is there, like, is the visual modeling, like, it's not temporal, right? Like, you're not... It, it is not temporal, um, yeah. so it's really just, um, I think that's a really interesting direction, but really the way it's working is it's saying, you know, here's this uh, reference um, descriptor from this image, please just try to track that in the current image. So it's not temporal, um, it's like zero shot. And I think having a temporal uh, model would be really interesting. And you can definitely put that structure into your network architecture. Then the question is, what do you supervise it with? So you either supervise it just with the imitation learning objective, which is quite a weak supervision for anything visual, or you need some sort of temporal um, like signal in your uh, visual training data. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so on the Clipboard paper, like, uh, Considering the like uh, language goals you give it, have you noticed yeah. like um, any behavior with the like sequence of words? Like, so if you just give the same sentence but you swap around the ordering of the words, um, do you notice any differences in behavior, or is it 
does it not matter? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, we're currently investigating uh, those kind of questions. So basically, like, what if we were to change the ordering? So, you know, basically, does clipboard, is it just thinking of it as like bag of words? Um, so it seems that when we change the ordering, it still works quite well. Um, if you just like give it, you know, like you, you create a different language, let's say by like swapping, um, you know, creating a, a mapping from, you know, the words to some other words and you feed that in, that doesn't work. Um, I mean, eventually with enough data, it can work. Um, but I guess the shorter answer is we're still investigating um, because you're doing supervised learning. It can, if you scramble the words, it can still learn to unscramble them given enough data, um, but it doesn't generalize um, as well. But I would say understanding exactly how the language is, is getting incorporated. So right now, it's, it's, it's just a big supervised learning problem, right? So there's no explicit structure of doing, like parsing this sentence and mapping it to specific pixels. It's all happening in this end-to-end -end model, which is actually a strength of the approach, I think, because that's what allows you to do all these different tasks. But we don't do anything to enforce, you know, how you use the language. So you can get into the following uh, problem, which is like, Let's say you created a biased data set where you don't actually need language to solve the problem. Um, then your model can effectively ignore the language um, and still solve it. Um, so we don't have a solution for that right now. It's something we're, we're uh, actively investigating, but I don't, I don't have any deep insights into how the language is actually getting used. We're, we're running experiments um, right now to sort of uh, tease that out. But I don't have any firm answers. Yeah, because I would be interested to see if you could somehow ground like the verbs, uh, like packing, picking, or grounding the nouns. Um, so grounding the nouns, that that is fine. Like, I don't think that's a problem. You just need to give a uh, demonstration. So if you had a task where you said, you know, pack, you know, whatever, the blue block, the blue block versus push the blue block, like it can do, it would be able to do both of those, I think, no problem. Um, as long as it's it's you know it's seen that verb in the uh, demonstration, right? It's not going to zero shot generalize to a new verb because the actual like what to do in terms of manipulation actions, right? Um, that's only coming from the demonstrations. So even if Clip knows what you know sweep means, which I doubt it knows because that's not something that occurs so much in image captioning. Um, then the, the, the agent isn't gonna be able to just do that zero shot. Um, I actually had, a, if I, you're finished, I had a question about that actually, which is sort of like, and you mentioned it during the talk as well. You, you might have talked more about this. I, I don't know if I just missed it, but like, what do you think, like how much do you think it can generalize zero shot in theory, right? Because like, Clip should have a lot of information about new stuff that you haven't seen in your training data set. Definitely it should know what other colors or other objects, but perhaps yeah. it could, in fact, even um, make it do new things. Like you could say, you know, stack a blue block on the green block, because it should know what, what you know, what a, block, uh, a blue block on, on top of a green block looks like. So yeah. it feels like, at least in theory, you should get a lot of zero shot generalization, uh, but you haven't shown that yet. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, let me try to answer that in two parts. Um, so I, I think uh, Clip does have a lot of zero shot uh, generalization ability in it, right? So just in terms of saying, um, recognizing, you know, what's a blue block versus a green block, Clip should be able to do that zero shot. I totally agree. Um, so the question is why, why is that zero shot generalization capability, let's just say on like detecting objects, why isn't that transferred over immediately to Clipboard? So at least one answer is Clip goes down to these like low dimensional uh, embeddings, right? Um, but because we wanna use this uh, action centric approach, right? We need to do, we need to bring these representations back up to full resolution, okay? So that we can decide, hey, this is the pixel we're gonna pick at. So to do that, we have all these decomp layers here, and these are all trainable. So the only thing that's, um, this is the part that's frozen, which is clip, but all these layers here are trainable, right? So I think that's what's stopping our zero shot 
uh, generalization right now on just like, let's say recognizing a color or something like that. Now, in terms of, so I think that's, that's one part of the answer, which is, you know, why can't we zero shot generalize to, to new colors? I think the other sort of more subtle answer is you, the only like manipulation part, the, the manipulation skills that you're learning are coming only through the demonstrations. So let's say that I showed you a bunch of demonstrations where you're, you know, picking and placing cuboid type objects. And now I show you like a pen or something very different, some like weird shape. And I ask you to do some pick and place with that. Um, if you don't like clip, isn't going to tell you like, what's the right way to like grasp this pen. Right. So actually having the like manipulation side of it, I don't think you're ever going to get that zero shot from clip, but I do agree on the visual side. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, sure, but maybe you could at least not require demonstrations because Clip should tell you when you grasp a pen, hopefully, like a new... But you need to know how pen. to grasp a pen, right? Yeah. So who tells right. you how to grasp a pen? E I don't think Clip can tell you that. Yeah, I suppose the robot would just have to figure it out by itself. But this isn't... So I think that's a really interesting direction for future work, but this is definitely... At least this, this is a kind of our first foray. Yeah. Um, it's very much in the imitation learning world, right? So um, that makes sense. Yeah. So I think I think if you have a way to combine some prior knowledge about grasping with a clip model, that would be really interesting. You know, so combining something like GPD or Dexnet, which is trained on a big synthetic data set, let's say. Um, but uh, this approach is the only data it saw, um, other than you know the clip pre-training, was the demonstrations. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We are currently seven minutes over. Um, so I think we should uh, thank Lucas for this wonderful talk and then not keep it too much longer. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hang out and answer a couple more questions if people have them, but um, happy to wrap up. Uh, yeah. It looks like Jessica has a question. Um, I think it was a clap, but. <laughs> oh, actually, uh, if it's okay, can I? ask you to entertain uh, one last question for me, I guess. Sure, I, uh, who's talking? It's hard for me to tell. Oh, uh, this is Leon. Um, I am not in the room, I'm in the Zoom. Uh, okay, space. yeah, I see, your, I see your little mic going. Yeah, go for <laughs> yeah. it. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, uh, yeah, and I, I guess just to make sure, Carl, I'm not like, the, the room isn't like uh, getting, uh, you know, you're not gonna get kicked out or anything, right? Yeah, I'm seeing doors. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it should be quick. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, um, so I wanted to ask, um, going back to sort of your uh, PhD work, um, going sure. back to like the ob object centric work, um, I kind of have more of a just general question about uh, the choice of representation. And I, I think you've done like, uh, all right, uh, I, I think your work really shows the strength of uh, key points uh, and dense correspondence based representations for. Um, most tasks that can be framed as rigid SE3 transformations of objects. But I'm just curious, like, uh, what kind of thoughts you have on um, how we can tackle and still, I don't know, so get some idea of like generalize, uh, instance level of generalization for more like forceful tasks or forceful manipulation tasks where you need to explicitly reason about. Um, uh, yeah, like the contact forces that are happening between objects. And um, I think there, I, I know this isn't your paper, like the uh, KPAM 2.0 work that like sort of just slaps on a coordinate frame. Yeah, like an impedance controller, yeah. Yeah, exactly in that sense. But yeah, I'm just w wondering like if you have uh, other thoughts you had about like what's missing or, uh, or how can you modify the representation to, um, yeah, reason about like, more forceful manipulation tasks, or or did did you feel like uh, very happy about just uh, living in a world where you just consider a rigid transformation? Um, yeah, so let me try to let me try to answer that. So I think um, let's say like key points, right? So like I'm going to track some key points on the object. That's going to be my uh, sort of state representation. So let's call that that's what X world is going to be. And then X robot could include like my joint angles. If I have a force torque sensor, I could look at my like 
uh, joint efforts, et cetera, right? So there's no nothing stopping you from getting um, like proprioceptive force information in. So the key points is really a, a visual representation about where objects are. So I think your, your question, which I think is a really good one is, okay, most of the tasks we showed, this robot was in kind of like a position control, a slightly compliant mode. Um, I think the question is, well, do you want your, are you doing a task that requires like force feedback? And then the question is like, where does that uh, like policy come from, right? So if you're doing, you know, imitation learning and you have some contact rich tasks and you have like force information going in as well as your key point tracks, I feel like you could still do imitation learning in, for contact rich tasks. And um, this like, not that it's a super contact rich task, but there's um, some of it there. So this like task where you have to push this plate, you have to actually like push it up against the wall and then you know do like the compliant move um, and stuff like that. Now, so I think your question is more about like, you know, how do we, how do we synthesize policies when the tasks are contact rich, right? Um, yeah. And I think that's a little, it's a really interesting question, but slightly orthogonal to like what the, if you're going to represent your object with key points or a latent code or whatever. Um, yeah, does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me.